Conventional wisdom from the auto enthusiast set tells us that the Prius is the ultimate driving appliance and that Toyota is behind the ball on electrification. But that only tells us half the story. In this video, I'm going to be talking about not just the Prius in this e-all-wheel drive format, but why this only tells half the story. Yes, half the story is that the Prius is the ultimate driving appliance. 21 years ago, the first generation Prius finally made its way to America. That Prius proved that gasoline electric hybrids not only worked, but they could also be reliable and incredibly long lasting. The Prius has generally been one of the most reliable vehicles in North America. And it's not uncommon to find first generation and second generation Priuses with over a quarter million miles on the clock. My next door neighbors had a second generation Prius and they put 280,000 miles on it. The gasoline engine was the one that ended up failing in the end. The battery and the electric motors worked fine all the way until the end. But over the last few years, Prius sales have been slowing. And some of the conventional wisdom says that the era of the Prius is over. But what that doesn't take into account is that in 2020, Toyota sold 337,000 full hybrid vehicles. Yes, the Prius was a part of that, a relatively small part, but the rest of the hybrids wouldn't have happened without the Prius. There once was a time where hybridization required a great deal of compromise. Not every vehicle was designed ground up to accommodate a hybrid system, so the battery pack had to go somewhere, eating into cargo room. Or when we're talking about aesthetics, the Prius look has been a little bit polarizing over time. But Toyota's lineup is full of no compromises hybrids now. We have the hybrid RAV4, which performs better than the non-hybrid model, and a full 27% of RAV4s go out the door as hybrids. 22% of Highlanders go out the door as hybrids, 12% of Camrys, and 100% of the new Sienna and Venza are full hybrids. None of that would have been possible without the Prius that I'm standing next to. Although you could argue that this Prius is a little bit compromised because of the hybrid system, mainly in the performance and I suppose the aesthetics department. Once upon a time, the quirky looks of the Prius were more of an asset than a detriment to Prius sales because people wanted everybody to know that they were driving the most efficient vehicle available in North America. Technically right now, the Prius is the second most efficient vehicle in North America because you can get a Hyundai Ioniq that gets 59 miles per gallon combined, a little bit higher than this one. But this model is the e all wheel drive version. So this is the most efficient vehicle you can buy in North America with all wheel drive. But then came along full EVs and a lot of folks decided that hybrids just weren't sexy anymore. Even though when you squint, the profile of the Prius has been replicated time and time again in other efficient vehicles, especially EVs, because this general profile gives you a good combination of interior space, cargo volume, and good aerodynamics. But the story gets a little bit more complicated here because arguably the bigger environmental impacts don't necessarily happen moving from a relatively efficient vehicle into a Prius, say you were already interested in fuel economy and environmentalism, but rather from something like a RAV4 to a RAV4 hybrid because you'll save an awful lot more gasoline. You'll actually save $800 a year on average moving from a non-hybrid to a hybrid RAV4. Moving from a hybrid RAV4 to a Prius, that's only gonna save you about $350 a year. And if you go from this to an Ionic at 59 miles per gallon, the savings is relatively small, just $50 a year. If there's one thing that's been baked into Toyota's DNA from the very beginning, it's a strong focus on engineering pragmatism and looking at things holistically rather than individually. And that's not necessarily what we see in some of the proponents for full battery electric vehicles at this moment. I have no doubt that full battery electric vehicles or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles or other zero emissions technologies will be the way to go in the future. But the question is, is that the right thing to do right now? And according to Toyota's engineers, and I have to agree with them, it may not necessarily be the case. You see, in 2020, 300,000 full battery electric vehicles were sold in the United States. That's less than the total sales of Toyota's hybrid electric vehicles. And if you look at year-on-year -year sales, established markets like California haven't really seen a growth in full battery electric vehicles. It appears that we're hitting some sort of prescribed limit here. But hybrid sales are actually on a pretty good increase. Aside from that though, let's talk about the impact of those 300,000 EVs sold in 2020. Assuming that someone went from the average efficient vehicle out there, 25 miles per gallon is the efficiency rating of the average new vehicle sold in North America, to a full EV, theoretically you could save 180 million gallons of gasoline. Assuming that your electricity, of course, was completely zero emissions, you'd also save the appropriate CO2 and emissions from that 180 million gallons consumed. But if you took that same number of batteries, and remember that batteries are a limited commodity from mining of the lithium to battery production, et cetera, you could have used that same amount of battery 
to make 14 million Prius type hybrids or RAV4 type hybrids or Highlander type hybrids or even Lexus performance hybrids. All of those would have about a 20% reduction in fuel economy versus the non-hybrid version. Obviously, the fuel efficiency impact would vary a bit based on the vehicle design. Say a half-ton pickup truck may not see the full 28%, but even if it didn't, you would still have saved 39 billion gallons of gasoline from being burnt in one year. That's a 79 times greater impact than having built just 300,000 EVs. In a rational world where we're thinking collectively about the emissions of every new vehicle sold in North America, obviously the mission should be hybridize everything first, then transition things perhaps to plug-in hybrids, then perhaps to complete zero emissions vehicles. The way that we as Americans, and yes, myself included in this statement, tend to look at problems is a little bit puritanical. We don't wanna slow down our consumption of alcohol or tobacco or drugs or whatever it is, gasoline, etc. We wanna stop completely. You don't see commercials for smoking mitigation or drinking mitigation. And we don't really see that many commercials for gasoline mitigation either. Instead, we want it to be cold turkey. But cold turkey may not be what's best for us as a society right now. In a nutshell, that's the problem with the Prius. This is the ultimate pragmatic vehicle, the ultimate driving appliance. It's about the same size as a Corolla, which is a pretty handy size, but it has 27.4 cubic feet of cargo capacity in the back about the same amount as a small crossover. It weighs 3,000 pounds, not much more than the average compact sedan, but 1,800 pounds less than a Ford Mustang Mach-E with a 270 mile range. This has a range of 519 to 640 miles. The hybrid system under this hood is one of the most innovative and I think one of the most interesting drivetrains available in North America. For the Prius, it's based around a 1.8 liter four cylinder engine that produces 96 horsepower. And the system horsepower total is 121 when combined with the two electric motors on this side of the engine bay. We'll talk about that in a bit. There are two different batteries used in the Prius, lithium ion or nickel metal hydride, depending on the trim level you get. And fuel economy will range between 56 miles per gallon at the most efficient, 49 miles per gallon at the lowest if you choose the e-all-wheel drive version. That's the model that I'm driving today. If you get the e-all-wheel drive model, then there's a third electric motor on the rear axle. That one's rated for seven horsepower and 40 pound-feet of torque. The mission of the rear electric motor in the Prius is simply to get it off the line, help improve traction in snow, wet weather, ice, etc. It's not meant to turn this into a Prius rock crawler. What's novel about this hybrid system is the transmission. Inside the transmission case, we do not have a CVT. A lot of people will mistakenly refer to Toyota and Lexus hybrids as having a CVT. That's not the case. Instead, we have a planetary power split hybrid system. In the traditional sense, this isn't a transmission as you would know it. It has a single planetary gear set, two electric motors, and the gasoline engine. One of the electric motors can drive the vehicle in electric only mode. It's directly connected to the front wheels, so in that mode it feels like a slightly less powerful electric vehicle than something like a Tesla Model 3. The gasoline engine can also power the wheels, but it can't do so directly. It has to involve the two electric motors for locomotion to happen. Some power is transmitted mechanically through the planetary gear set, but some of the power goes from one motor generator unit to the other, and then to the wheels. That's why this has sort of a CVT feel, because the engine can be spinning really in a wide variety of different RPMs, and the electric motors are controlling the way that the power is being transmitted to the wheels. But because of the style of this hybrid system, it honestly feels a little bit more like an EV, with the engine just doing whatever it needs to, than a traditional vehicle with a CVT. This same hybrid system has been adapted to a wide variety of different applications in the Toyota and Lexus envelope. We have the RAV4 hybrid, the Highlander hybrid. Those use a two and a half liter variation of this same sort of system with just scaled up electric motors on this side. Then we have the Lexus rear wheel drive performance hybrids, which integrate a very similar hybrid system in a rear wheel drive transmission with a four speed transmission as well. That gives those systems excellent performance and it also theoretically could give them good towing performance if that hybrid system was adapted to other rear-wheel drive truck-like vehicles. Stay tuned because that's probably what we're gonna see in upcoming Toyota trucks. The big thing about this hybrid system is that it's incredibly smooth because of the design of the system. It does not have a stepped automatic under the hood like we find in some Hyundai and Kia hybrids or European hybrids. It doesn't have dual clutches or a single clutch or a torque converter or anything like that. It doesn't even have a CVT as I mentioned before. And there have been hybrids out there like from Nissan that used a conventional CVT. The smoothness of this system is why it has been replicated by some other manufacturers like Ford, like General Motors, and like Chrysler. All of those hybrid systems operate on a very similar principle. 
The roominess of the Prius is a direct result of its lift back styling. The rear end of the vehicle has sort of an homage, I guess you'd say, to a trunk lid right there. But when you're looking through the rear view mirror, you're looking through this piece of glass right here and the piece of glass above this integrated spoiler. Being a lift back, we have a cargo area that is suspiciously similar to the average compact crossover at over 27 cubic feet. This is a very large and very accommodating cargo area. If you're looking for a compact, inexpensive vehicle that can accommodate a barbecue from Home Depot or Lowe's, this is one of the few. Under the cargo area load floor, there's a bit of additional storage space. This is where we find the can of fix -a flat and the tire inflator, but this cargo area was designed for a spare tire. So if you want to put a spare tire in here yourself, it will accommodate one completely under the load floor. Jumping inside, we find front seats that are just about as comfortable as any inexpensive compact car in North America. We have a tilt telescopic steering column with a fairly small range of motion and definitely an unusual style to the dashboard that we'll take a look at in a bit. One of the things that's always made the Prius very practical is that the ceiling is quite high. With the seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have about four inches of headroom left. Moving to the back, I have a reasonable amount of legroom with this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall. Combined legroom figures are pretty similar to the Corolla, about one inch less. I have about half an inch of headroom sitting very upright back here. And thanks to the, just the size and the shape of the Prius, the interior feels a little bit more spacious than the average compact sedan. But this is still a compact sedan, so the rear bench is not quite as generously sized as something like the Camry. And it's worth noting that the Camry Hybrid's fuel economy is suspiciously similar to the Prius that I'm driving right here. You can get a Camry at around 50 mpg. This one's rated for 49. As with the exterior design, the interior design of the Prius has long been a little bit quirky to help separate it from just regular vehicles in the Toyota lineup. We have two-way adjustable headrests, height adjustable shoulder belts. This interior is all charcoal, so we have some eco-friendly upholstery here on the front seats. Some soft touch materials on the front door panels, but keep in mind this is a relatively inexpensive vehicle. However, we do find more premium touches in here than some compact stands. So the upper portion of the door and this mid portion of the door are both soft touch materials. Moving over to the dashboard, we also have a soft touch injection molded dashboard, a style of the trim here that actually reminds me a little bit of what we see in the new Highlander. There's a color touchscreen infotainment system right here in the middle. This is not the largest one available in the Prius lineup, but it does support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Then we have the somewhat controversial LCD instrument cluster in the middle of the dashboard. On the left side, we have two small LCDs, one that gives us things like the speedometer and the fuel level, one that gives us a bunch of different eco readouts. And then we have the shifter in an LED array right there in the middle, and then a bunch of warning lights on the right side. This entire pod is mounted atop the dashboard right there, meaning that there is nothing Thing in front of the steering wheel. If you prefer readouts right in front of you, the Prius is available with a heads-up display. We have a wrapped steering wheel. The controls for the infotainment system are over here on the left side. The trip button controls the trip computer in that multifunction instrument cluster. On the right side of the wheel, we have the heated steering wheel button, the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, and then this button array controls that right side LCD in the instrument cluster. Now that we're out on the road, let's get the numbers out of the way first. This goes zero to 60 in 9.7 seconds and stops from 60 miles an hour to zero in 126 feet. Now let's talk about why the Prius has a reputation for being the ultimate driving appliance. Obviously, this vehicle is very focused on efficiency, and that's why we have that slow zero to 60 time. Although there are a decent number of other vehicles out there that will go zero to 60 in nine or 10 seconds. The Prius is not exactly alone in that regard. But the Prius also handles a little bit poorer than something like a Honda Civic or even a Toyota Corolla. They're gonna feel a little bit sharper out on the road. Weight has definitely been kept in check for this generation of the Prius. Again, this weighs about 3,000 pounds. That's a little bit more than some compact sedans, but honestly, not far off of the average compact hatchback or a number of small crossovers. And you would need to look at a small crossover to get the same kind of cargo capacity that we find back there behind the second row seats. Even though Toyota has been selling hybrids in the US for 21 years, they're a little bit misunderstood. So let's talk about how the hybrid system functions and why you would want a hybrid system. Like most hybrids sold in North America, this is a gasoline electric hybrid system. You put gasoline in the tank and that's all you do. You don't ever plug a regular hybrid in. There are plug-in hybrids where you can plug the hybrid into your electric outlet at home and charge the battery pack, but that's not this kind of Prius. If you want that, that's the Prius Prime. The key reason for hybridizing a vehicle is that you can give the vehicle a less powerful and more efficient gasoline engine because you have the electric motors on board. This gasoline engine produces under 100 horsepower and it runs on the Atkinson cycle, not the auto cycle. That particular cycle trades efficiency for a reduction in torque. But that's not a problem because electric motors deliver a lot of torque at very low RPMs. 
When you're taking off from a stop or when you're demanding hard acceleration like I'm doing right now, power comes from the battery to the electric motors. It's then joined by the gasoline engine to give you 121 horsepower total. And then when you relax your foot on the accelerator pedal, the gasoline engine can then spin up a little bit more than it would normally need to, to then charge the battery from the electric motors. And of course, when you slow down, the gasoline engine can turn off immediately because the air conditioning is powered by the electric motors and it's not needed anymore. Instead, the electric motors are now being used to regenerate power back into the battery regen braking. And the Toyota uses a blended braking system. So anytime you're using the brake pedal, as long as the system can regenerate electricity into the battery and give you the braking effort that you're requesting, the physical brakes in the car are not being used. The brake pads will start touching the brake rotors when you're commanding more braking than the vehicle can deliver with just the regen braking alone. Out on a rougher gravel road like the one that I'm on here, the Prius' suspension is relatively soft. And that makes the Prius very easy to live with even if you live out in the country like I do. Again, my next door neighbors drive on this exact same road every day and they lived for many, many years of the Prius and had absolutely no problem. Of course, the Prius E all-wheel drive is gonna give you that added level of traction if you need it, but it's not gonna turn this into a rugged off-road vehicle. If I stop right here and I floor it, the front tires are definitely still scrabbling for traction, but the extra seven horsepower on the rear axle and an important 40 pound feet of torque mean that at very low speeds, say zero to five miles an hour, this vehicle can send a reasonable portion of power to the rear axle. Again, never as much as a physical all-wheel drive system one with a locking center coupling, especially something like a regular RAV4 or a regular Toyota Highlander, but it's still gonna be better than not having that electric motor in the rear. Now, if you want that next level of e-all-wheel drive capability and you're willing to give up nine miles per gallon, then you could get a RAV4 hybrid. It would get 40 MPG and it would have a much more powerful electric motor on the rear. It's important to remember that simply adding electric motors to the equation and changing little else about the vehicle has a very very small impact on fuel economy. That's why we see a number of hybrids out there, like the Ford F-150 hybrid, that don't really give you that much better fuel economy than some of the other versions. And that's because relatively little was changed about the vehicle. It still uses the same 10-speed automatic transmission you find in the F-150. It just replaces the torque converter with a clutch and an electric motor setup. The novel thing about the Toyota hybrid system, whether we're talking about the one in the Prius or the RAV4 or the new Sienna, etc., is that Toyota took a much more holistic approach to designing the drivetrain of the vehicle. They didn't simply downsize the engine. They gave it the really innovative dual motor hybrid system that we find in all Toyota and Lexus hybrids. They also made the engine run on a more efficient combustion cycle. And then because we have a big battery pack on board and those hefty electric motors, it can drive in EV range relatively easily at low speeds. Some people have criticized Toyota for not enabling EV operation at higher speeds. Honestly, there's no rational reason to do that because at those speeds, it's just more efficient to run the gasoline engine and all the power is coming from the gas engine to start with. That's also why EV range in a vehicle like this is absolutely inconsequential. Who cares how long this can go in EV only mode because all of that energy came from the gasoline tank in the back in the first place. All that I really care about is what's the fuel economy and Toyota hybrids have excellent fuel economy at a wide range of speeds because of this hybrid design. So it's not like the Honda hybrid systems because they have a fixed gear ratio where over speeds of 75 or 80 miles an hour like you find legally in Texas, for instance, fuel economy really falls off a cliff. In Toyota hybrid systems, the fuel economy progression is just as you'd expect out of a normal vehicle. Sure, it's lower at 75 or 80 MPG, but it's gonna be significantly higher than something like the Honda Insight. Because we have the high voltage system on board required for those electric motors and a relatively decently sized battery pack to power them, Toyota was also able to give us an electric air conditioning system that offers us the same kind of air conditioning output whether the vehicle is idling or stopped, etc. So the gasoline engine does not need to run in order to run the air conditioning, as we see in mild hybrids out there like the e-torque systems that we find from Stellantis or a number of the early belt alternator starter systems that we see out of General Motors and a number of other vehicle manufacturers out there that are using 48 volt mild hybrids but don't have electric air conditioning compressors. You will see a big savings in fuel economy in hotter climates like in the south with this style of hybrid because the gasoline engine doesn't need to run all the time. When it does need to charge the battery, it steps up its RPMs, generates electricity, charges the battery, and then can run the air conditioning for another extended period of time. Also, when going down a hill like here, the engine doesn't need to be on for any speed because it's just not required. It's able to actually run the air conditioning simply off of the regen braking 
going down this hill. Now back to the driving appliance part. Yes, the Prius is definitely not the most exciting vehicle out there. This pulls 0.8 Gs on the average skid pad test, pretty similar to some low end compact stands. It's not especially exciting. But what is exciting is that this Prius is the reason that we have the Highlander and the RAV4, which are honestly no compromise hybrids. The RAV4 hybrid gives you better zero to 60 performance, very similar 60 to zero stopping distances, and the same kind of handling scores that we find in the non-hybrid RAV4, but you get 40 MPG. The Highlander Hybrid gives up a little bit in performance, but it gains an incredible amount in terms of fuel economy, over 35 miles per gallon in real world driving with seven people on board. Now with statements like that, you might be wondering what is the future of the Prius in the Toyota lineup? I don't know if I have an answer for that. Toyota has not really been horribly specific about the future for the Prius. Prius sales have been declining year on year because of the rest of Toyota's hybrid lineup, but I suspect this still has a future inside the Toyota envelope. Exactly what that future looks like we don't know quite yet, but we do know that Toyota's next generation of full battery electric vehicles are not going to be wearing the Prius nameplate. Instead, they're going to be called B. BZ. The BZ4X is going to be their first battery electric vehicle built in any kind of real production numbers. We have had full electric versions of other Toyotas before, but this is going to be the first one that they're going to be building in volume, and it's going to be part of a new all-electric portfolio of vehicles. And of course, Toyota also has fuel cell vehicles out there. There's the new Toyota Mirai, which is the first rear-wheel drive hydrogen vehicle that they've ever sold, and there are rumors that there may even be a Lexus version coming soon. I think arguably the Prius is still the ultimate green vehicle available in the United States because people buy EVs for a variety of different reasons. They may buy them because of low emissions. They may buy them because they can access the carpool lane solo in states like California. They may be buying a Tesla for the image, the brand, the luxury, the gadgets, etc. But really the only reason you're buying a Prius is either for the green image or for the low cost of operations. Definitely something to keep in mind with the Prius. The Prius also has a low sticker price compared to some of those alternative green vehicles like full EVs or plug-in hybrids or hydrogen vehicles. The L Eco model starts at $24,535, and if you want all-wheel drive, this is one of the least expensive high-efficiency vehicles to get it in. $27,135 will get you that. But for some reason, you can only buy the all-wheel drive option in essentially LE and XLE trims. You cannot get it in the top-end limited trim, so not all of the options available in the Prius are available with all-wheel drive. The other odd thing with the Prius is that there aren't really many alternatives in the US. If you're looking for over 50 miles per gallon in a gasoline fueled vehicle, there are very, very few options. It's basically the Prius and the Hyundai Ioniq. The Ioniq is very Prius-like in its shape. It's definitely a Hyundai Prius imitation, if you will, but all-wheel drive is not offered on that model. Now, obviously all-wheel drive on the Prius is not the most robust all-wheel drive system, but it is gonna make the vehicle feel more sure-footed in adverse weather situations. If you wanna know more on that, I have an ICE video where I was able to take the Prius all-wheel drive out on an ICE track. It does surprisingly well, even from a standstill. The electric motor that that's offered in the back of the Prius and the electric motor that's offered in the back of a wide variety of Toyota and Lexus hybrids really differentiate them from the majority of the hybrid competition because there are a few all-wheel drive hybrids out there, but by and large, most of them have mechanical all-wheel drive systems like the Hyundai Santa Fe hybrid that I happen to be driving this week. It has exactly the same all-wheel drive system that we find in the regular model, only it's coupled with an electric motor and the engine up front. The upside for that is improved winter traction. You can definitely sell a lot more power to the rear axle. The downside is fuel economy, and that's why the Prius is so incredibly efficient. That also explains the high efficiency ratings that we find in other hybrid models in the Toyota and Lexus lineups that use all-wheel drive with an electric motor in the rear. You could, of course, get a full electric vehicle like the Mustang Mach-E that Alex and Autos currently owns. That will set you back at least $45,500 if you want the dual motor option, less, of course, the $7,500 federal tax credit if you qualify for the full credit but you'll only get 211 miles of range. And any way you slice it, that is going to be an awful lot more expensive than the Prius. It also could be a little bit more expensive to operate depending on exactly how much you pay for energy in your area of the country. 
I think in many ways the most direct competitor to the Prius is found within the Toyota lineup. Toyota has done such an incredible job with their hybrid systems, honestly, that the reason to buy a Prius has been declining over time. And I think that's why Prius sales have really dropped from their heights only about a decade ago or so. You can get a Toyota Camry with considerably more power, a ton more room, a real trunk, less controversial styling, etc. And you'll get about 50 miles per gallon in that model with over 200 horsepower under the hood. I think the real problem for the Prius all-wheel drive and the reason that I personally would not buy a Prius is that there are so many excellent hybrid options from Toyota at the moment. And honestly, they're the best competitors because if you're looking for something with less controversial styling, a lot more room on the inside, more features, more luxury, more power, better braking, etc., better handling, you could get a Toyota Camry. And the Camry, even though it's not going to have all-wheel drive, it is going to be significantly significantly faster than the Prius, and the fuel economy penalty is really quite minor. If you're gentle on the throttle in the Camry Hybrid, you can, honest to goodness, get 50 miles per gallon out of a mid-sized sedan. That is an incredible number. And if that wasn't enough to convince you, you could get a 36 miles per gallon Highlander Hybrid with all-wheel drive. You could get a 40 MPG RAV4 Hybrid. You could get the Toyota Venza Hybrid if you want something with a bit more style and about the same size as the RAV4. In a logical world, however, it's the RAV4 Hybrid that I think has really put the nail in the coffin in terms of sales for the Prius. If you look at the sales charts, you'll notice that Prius sales have been on a decline for about the last 10 years or so, and they've really accelerated lately with the advent of the current generation RAV4 Hybrid. The RAV4 Hybrid starts at $28,800, so it's only about $1,000 more than the base Prius. You get a little bit better feature content, way less controversial styling, more interior room, more interior comfort, it feels newer, it feels fresher, it is certainly faster as well because it has the more modern 2.5 liter hybrid system from Toyota. And at 40 miles per gallon, yes, the fuel economy is unquestionably going to be lower, but it's not as much lower as you might think because jumping from 40 MPG in the all-wheel drive version of the RAV4 hybrid into an all-wheel drive Prius is only going to save the average person in California at $4 a gallon $300 a year. And if you live outside of California, that difference is going to be even smaller. Some folks out there, the difference may be just $200 a year. In addition to that, the all-wheel drive system that we find in the RAV4 Hybrid is much more capable than the one that we find in the Prius. It's not as capable as the mechanical all-wheel drive system that we find in the Ford Escape Hybrid or the other versions of the RAV4 available in the United States, but it is going to be significantly more capable than the one in the Prius because it has a bigger electric motor, it's more willing to send power to the rear axle, and up to, say, about half throttle applications in the RAV4, or about that kind of power, it can send essentially 50% of the power and torque to the rear axle, so it's going to feel more like a traditional gasoline-powered vehicle. In addition to that, of course, if you're worried about all-wheel drive performance, slippery weather performance, etc., you probably want a little bit of extra ground clearance clearance, and you'll find a ton more ground clearance in the RAV4 Hybrid. So my bottom line with the Prius, to be perfectly honest, is don't buy the Prius all-wheel drive. If you're looking at a Prius and you want the most fuel efficiency, just get the base model. That is going to be one of the lowest cost to operate vehicles in North America. It's also very practical. But if you think you want all-wheel drive and you're taking a look at the all-wheel drive Prius, just walk right past it, unless you get a screaming deal on it, I guess, and get the RAV4 Hybrid. It's simply a better vehicle. And I think that's why RAV4 Hybrid sales have eclipsed Prius sales by a pretty decent margin for 2020 and for 2021. RAV4 Hybrid sales have absolutely exploded, and according to Toyota, more than a quarter of RAV4s sold in the United States, over 100,000 units a year, are the hybrid model. I think it's pretty easy to see why. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and what would you buy if you were looking to spend a price tag of $27,135 to $29,575? Would you be willing to get the Prius or would you simply get something like the RAV4 Hybrid? Or, honestly, keep in mind, the Venza has not been selling as well as Toyota might have thought. And so in certain areas of the country, you can actually get a Venza for less than a RAV4 Hybrid. If you can do that, my next door neighbor was actually able to work one of those deals. She got a Venza. It ended up being less than a RAV4 Hybrid with comparable equipment on it. That's a great deal as well. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. Find me over at facebook.com slash alexandos Instagram, all those other social places. And of course, check out the merch store at aoamerch.com. I'll see all of you later.